fluidphysiology.org welcomes you to this presentation entitled Getting to Grips with the Steady State Starling Principle. Our intended audience is students of medicine and veterinary sciences, and in particular for those people who prescribe intravenous fluids to their patients. In this presentation, we are talking specifically about continuous non-fenestrated capillaries that serve most of the tissues of the body, the central nervous system, the heart, the lungs, skin, connective tissues, muscles, mesentery, and more. I'll address the physiology of other capillary types in a later presentation. The smallest continuous capillaries are encircled by just two fried egg-shaped endothelial cells, joined at their edges by tight junction strands, vascular endothelial cadrins and catenins, and platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecules. Overlying the luminal surface of the endothelial cells and their interendothelial junctions is a continuous endothelial surface layer. It appears in green in the cartoon on the next slide. This is a graphic representation of traditional teaching about the ways in which gases, nutrients, salts and water enter and leave the tissues from the microcirculation that supplies them. Take a moment or two to look it over and see if it represents what you were taught at college when you were studying biology or medicine. Oxygen and nutrients diffuse to the tissues, while carbon dioxide diffuses from the tissues back to the plasma. Fluid is filtered and then it's reabsorbed, while a small excess of interstitial fluid is drained as lymph to one of the great veins. You were taught about the Starling forces and how along the length of just a single capillary, fluid was initially filtered from plasma to the tissues and then reabsorbed from the tissues back into the plasma. Notice that only two Starling forces were considered. The interstitial pressure was presumed to be close to atmospheric pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure of the interstitium was presumed to be negligible. In fact, the interstitial pressure can be subatmospheric or in some circumstances even positive. And most of the body's albumin is in the interstitial space, where the average colloid osmotic pressure is around about one third of the plasma colloid osmotic pressure. It is likely that you were taught that capillary walls have many small pores that allow salts and water to pass, and a few large pores that permit larger molecules like albumin to enter the interstitial space. Capillary pressure, you were taught, drives fluid out to the interstitium, while plasma colloid osmotic pressure draws fluid back into the plasma. But we now know that on the luminal side of every capillary, there is an endothelial surface layer, which contains an endothelial glycocalyx, which creates the small pore effect allowing very few, if any, larger molecules to enter the subglycocalic space during fluid filtration. The colloid osmotic pressure in this protected region is very low. Capillary pressure is highest at the point at which blood enters the capillary from an arteriole. As blood moves along the capillary, hydrostatic pressure falls, and as a consequence, Filtration slows. As filtration slows, protein molecules can diffuse from the general interstitial space into the interendothelial clefts, which are a distinct microdomain of the interstitial fluid. As filtration slows, the colloid osmotic pressure in the subglycocalic space rises. At this point, we have two important principles for you to contemplate and commit to your understanding. Firstly, the colloid osmotic pressure of the interstitium does not directly influence the transendothelial filtration rate of fluid. Secondly, 
the dependence of the colloid osmotic pressure difference on the transendothelial filtration rate ensures that at steady state there is only filtration and no reabsorption of filtered fluid from the interstitium at any capillary pressure. If you have grasped the two points on the preceding slide, you now understand the glycocalyx model. Professor J. Rodney Levick of St. George's Hospital Medical School in London made important contributions to the physiology, but in his textbook, he describes this mechanism as the Michel Weinbaum model in honour of Professor Charles Michel of London and Sheldon Weinbaum of New York. These two gentlemen independently proposed the hypothesis which was later established in the laboratories of Adamson, Curry and others. So let's go over what we should be teaching students of human physiology now. Take a moment or two to reflect on the graphics on this slide before moving on to the next one. Fluid filtration is much less than is traditionally taught. In health, around eight liters of water passes from capillaries to the interstitium every day. Fluid reabsorption does not occur in continuous capillaries unless there is an abrupt change in the Starling forces. An abrupt fall in capillary pressure can be brought about by acute blood loss or by the injection of an arteriolar vasoconstrictor like noradrenaline. In humans, that can lead to an autotransfusion of up to 500 mils of interstitial fluid back to the plasma, but the absorptive process is only transient, lasting perhaps 20 minutes. Around eight liters a day of afferent lymph is pumped to the lymph nodes. Note that interstitial pressure is often subatmospheric, and so to remove fluid from the interstitium requires an active pumping mechanism. From the lymph arriving at lymph nodes, about four liters a day of fluid is absorbed to the plasma by lymph node capillaries and venules. That leaves around four liters of lymph with a very high protein concentration to be pumped as efferent to lymph to the thoracic duct. We can now appreciate that there are two important circulations of fluid around the body. There is a circulation of five liters of blood, which is plasma and blood cells, at about five liters a minute. In addition, there is a linked circulation of around 18 liters of extracellular fluid bathing the other body cells at around about six mils per minute. Time to do a recap on the Michel Weinbaum model. As the transendothelial pressure difference falls, the transendothelial filtration rate also falls. As the transendothelial filtration rate falls, the colloid osmotic pressure in the subglycocalic space rises, causing the colloid osmotic pressure difference to diminish. The net transendothelial filtration pressure is therefore always positive. The filtration reabsorption rule of yesterday becomes today's no reabsorption rule. By way of a self-test, let's end with a puzzle. In 1896, Ernest Starling injected saline into the rear leg of an anaesthetized dog and showed that it was quickly absorbed into the bloodstream by the colloid osmotic pressure of plasma. Now, explain using the steady state principle how such absorption can and does occur in this situation.